Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our virtual service at Plymouth Congregational Church in Minneapolis. We are glad that you are here or there or wherever you are. Wherever you are right now, wherever you have been in your life, and wherever you feel you are going, you are welcome with us in whatever way you are, whether it is in this room in a future date or watching this today. So for you, it is Sunday, March 29th, but for us, for me right now, it is Friday. We have recorded this beforehand, along with some elements of Palm Sunday, so that we can take the utmost care and distance from one another. We've heard from many people that this is something that has been very meaningful, but you've had concerns about our health and safety. So in response to that, we have decided to take a long time this Friday and record all of this in sections and segments that will be edited together. Going forward, you will start to see things change. We will not be recording from the sanctuary um, in all of the weeks going forward. We have recorded some elements here today for Palm Sunday, so you will see that, but you will likely start seeing things from people's homes as we stop coming in and follow many of the orders that are coming from our governor. So this recording will be put on our website every Sunday in the morning, and then will also be put on Facebook um, at 10.30 in an attempt to have a live experience if that is something you are looking for. So we are glad that you are with us. We miss you. We miss being with you. Someday soon. Since this is still a church service, we still are hoping for an offering. And since that's not something that we could do right now in this empty room, we would, we're asking that you still give as you normally would or even more generously, and you can do so online. And don't feel bad about putting in $5 or $25 in, as you would into a plate. We um, welcome everything. We are still... Um, paying all of our employees. That is a way that we can support each other. And we have also lost some revenue in things closing down in our church. So anything that you can do to be generous is well received. Thank you. As you maybe have seen on our website or have heard in other places, we will have no services no in-person services or programs at Plymouth for all of April and likely into May and possibly all of May. We are taking this as day by day right now, but for sure there will be no in-person services in April and probably not until mid-May. That means that Easter will be done in this format. We will do something and be sending it out to you. And our Easter offering this year, of, and many members will have received a letter in the mail, is going to Beacon Interfaith Housing. Please send that in. You do not need to wait until Easter to send it in. You can do it right now as you are listening to us. Please be generous. Beacon needs it. We all need all of our generosity in the world right now. On our website and on our social media every day, there are four opportunities that we present. Every morning, there is a morning meditation with one of the clergy. There is midday music with Philip. There is bedtime stories with Nina in the evening. And then there is an eight o'clock meditation that happens on Zoom. Please participate as you will. Uh, you can watch previous days ones on our YouTube channel. They are all there for you. We are doing everything we can to be in connection and relationship, even in this time of distance. If anybody needs or knows somebody who needs any pastoral care, conversations, or help, please contact us. You can talk, talk to Beth Faith directly, or you can call Paula or myself, or call the church, and it will direct you to the, on, to the pastoral care line. We are here with you in this. And even if you just need somebody to listen for a moment, we have open ears and we would like to hear from you. Those are all of our announcements for this morning and we are glad that you are here.
Our peace candle lighting this morning, which is part of our first service, is for kindness. In this time of change and unknown, in this time of anxiety, kindness is needed more than ever, both for ourselves and for each other and for the world around us. This prayer is for kindness. And here, a poem. A poem by Naomi Shihab Nye called Kindness. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride thinking the bus will never stop, the passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you. How he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then, it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is you I have been looking for. And then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. Amen. Good morning. My name is Beth Hoffman Faith, and I am the Minister for Congregational Care and Worship at Plymouth Congregational Church. I am grateful that we are in the midst of a sermon series on the fruits of the Spirit. It seems necessary in these days to continually remind ourselves of the character traits that root us in an understanding of the significance of human connection. In case you need a refresher or have forgotten the Sunday school song that many of us learned as children, here's the Apostle Paul's invitation to the people of Galatia and ultimately to each one of us of what it takes to live life seated in the Spirit. As is written in the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. I might add that there is no executive order prohibiting these things either. Today our fruit of the Spirit is kindness. 
that beautiful possibility of opening our heart to another and experiencing the blessing of connection. Here are two scripture readings for today that emphasize kindness. The first from the Old Testament, the prophet Micah in the sixth chapter. God has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what is required of you is to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God. And from the book of Ephesians in the Newer Testament, chapter 4, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Let us pray. Holy One, Open our hearts to a new perspective as we ponder the meaning of kindness in this time of distancing and isolation. Amen. I have to admit, it is hard for me to believe that just one month ago, I was traveling along the Arizona-Mexico border with over 20 other Plymouthites. It seems like a lifetime ago now. Our goal was both simple and complicated. We wanted to witness what is happening on the Mexico border and see for ourselves what we had only read about and watched on the newsreels. Our itinerary was ambitious and significant. We spent time in Tucson hearing what local groups like the Samaritans are doing to serve the migrants. We walked through the desert, humbled by simple crosses marking spots where human remains had been found. Desperate people longing for shelter and security and sanctuary and instead sacrificing their lives for it. We sat in a federal courtroom and watched as 70 people shackled in chains on their wrists and their ankles were paraded in front of the judge only to be deported, never having a chance to tell their story or articulate their hope. The same judge spoke to our group afterwards, answering our questions with surprising candidness, admitting that the system is terribly broken and the way things are done are not the just way or the humane way. And he was very clear that the only pathway to change in our immigration courts is to elect different people with different values to office. Because no matter how high a wall is built or how restrictive the crossing laws become or how severe the punishment For illegal entry, there will always be people risking everything to step onto American soil, fleeing the cartels that kill their children, kidnap the women, and torture the men. On two significant days, we piled into rented 15 passenger vans and spent time on the border, both the American side and the Mexico side. For some of you, a bit distressed by the amount of time you are now spending alone, this may sound like exactly what your extroverted self needs, to cram into a van with 14 other people and travel into an unfamiliar country. But ask any one of our folks who had to sit in the very back seat for 12 hours, and they might tell you social distancing is much preferred. But I never heard a complaint, and these were the days that held the most impact for me. Aside from traveling skyward up the most precariously steep hill I have ever traveled to visit a shelter in Nogales, Mexico, our travels were safe and secure. This particular moment, however, makes my palms sweat just thinking about it. Following our fearless guide, a retired UCC minister who was driving the other van, 
it became clear as we struggled towards the top of the hill that one, if I took my foot off the brake, we would slide backwards, and two, the only way down was to turn around. As 15 people were trying to tell me what to do and my head was spinning and my stomach churning, a man appeared at the driver's side window. He had the kindest eyes and a gentle smile. While language was a barrier for us, he helped me get to a place where someone else could take the wheel, my hero, John Shank, and with confidence could land the van in a safe spot. Later, I learned the man's name is Ugo, and he was the shelter supervisor and was waiting for the possibility of asylum with his family. After safely parking the vans, we all gathered to learn more about those staying in the shelter and hearing their stories. And I asked, what could we do for them? And Ugo, again with the gentlest eyes, looked at me and said in Spanish, tell people, tell people in America that we are not bad people. That may have been the most poignant moment of the whole experience for me, especially after it was Ugo who had rescued me just moments earlier when I feared for the safety of a van full of beloved people who were in my care. Even in the midst of his family's predicament, waiting in agonizing anticipation for a first border interview, Ugo did not hesitate to help, to reassure, to be a calming presence. And that, my friends, is the epitome of kindness. The plan for today was to have many of those who traveled to the border here to lead worship, to share their experiences through this time together in addition to other opportunities for small group gatherings. And that will happen when it is safe for us to be together again, because what we saw and heard and felt were life-changing. We cannot unsee what we witnessed. We will never forget the stories we heard, the people we met, the looks of trauma on the migrants' faces, combined with the hope for the possibilities of a new future. We will not forget the ugliness of the wall, the bitterness of tears shed for the helplessness we felt, the children who laughed and played and smiled at us with unabashed joy. And we will not forget the helpers we met, the fierce determination of those who have dedicated their lives to the plight of the migrant, who work every day so that a few might know shelter and safety, have food and fresh clothing. We need to share this with you over and over again so that you might join us as we work for the well-being of the immigrants in our own community and as we advocate to create a country that will practice radical hospitality and welcome rather than hostility, cruelty, and exclusion. And so, since our travelers could not be with me today, I asked them to reflect on this question. How did you witness and also experience kindness during our border immersion endeavors. How did you witness and also experience kindness during our border immersion endeavors? On our second day in the 15 passenger vans, we traveled across the Arizona landscape to the town of Douglas, across the border from Agua Prieta, Mexico. It was there we met Sister Judy and Sister Lucy, part of the order of the Sisters of Notre Dame, who warmly welcomed us into their home before escorting us across the border and guiding us through our day of meeting migrants 
waiting for their first credible fear interview, as well as taking us to see some glimmers of hope at a women's cooperative and then a coffee cooperative right there in Agua Prieta. Our day ended with our return to Douglas to participate in a weekly vigil in which folks gather in a public square every week and lift up a cross for each person found dead in the nearby Arizona desert since the year 2000. 300 souls were named and crosses laid on the curb of a busy street and these crosses dotted the scenery for blocks. Words do not do that experience justice. It was this day that seemed to have the greatest impact on our travelers because of what we witnessed from this pair of nuns and their relentless work of hospitality and kindness towards the migrant and towards us. This is what some of the members of our group noticed. One wrote, the Sisters of Notre Dame demonstrate kindness in so many ways. They make many trips across the border to be certain migrants in the shelter and in the tent are safe. Despite their busy lives full of kindness, the sisters welcomed all of us into their home to use bathrooms and to eat the fresh bars they had baked for us, not once but twice during our day with them. And another wrote, Sisters Judy and Lucy, as the penultimate in kindness, true heroines, they are selfless, completely devoted to those to whom they minister and have devoted their lives to caring for persecuted immigrants. I think about them every day as examples in kindness, humility, and purity. And yet another traveler wrote, I remember thinking about how modestly the nuns lived in their residence near the border, and yet they had prepared scrumptious homemade bars for us to enjoy. That's an act of kindness that meant a lot to me. The nuns just in general seemed to be full of kindness. We saw it too when the child was crying at the shelter and a nun brought a treat of some kind to calm him. For me, the epitome of kindness was expressed in Sister Judy's smile. As she escorted us through our day, each of us struggling with what we were seeing, Sister Judy would look upon us and smile, and that alone would be balm for our splintered hearts. I would watch her interact with those to whom she ministered, and her smile never wavered. She was never without a kind word or a gentle touch. And while we grappled with the enormous emotional impact of the Healing Our Borders vigil, Sister Judy guided us with her smile, reassuring and constant. As we move through our own time of isolation, distance, insecurity about the future, kindness must become our spiritual practice. In the words from the prophet Micah, we are told that God not only expects us to do justice, but we are required to love kindness. Social justice workers and advocates often use this text to champion a life's mission rooted in the work of justice and peace, yet we cannot do justice if we do not practice kindness. The two hold hands in an effort to live humbly and rooted in God's presence. Kindness is not a trite expression of being nice. Kindness is the selfless offering so as to lift up and encourage another. Jane Thompson, a Plymouth member and a border trip participant, writes this. Now and during the border immersion trip, the very essence of kindness for me is to see the heart of another and have my own heart seen. There's a knowing that extends beyond information and empathy. The greatest kindness, the most sacred exercise in kindness, is to see the heart of another. The poem Kindness 
by Naomi Shahab Nye that Seth read earlier has become a favorite of mine since discovering it a few years ago. I have offered it before on a Sunday morning and I shared this poem with my fellow travelers during a morning meditation while we were away and in the last two weeks the words have reminded me of the significance of kindness as a spiritual practice written while lost and desperate after being robbed of everything on her honeymoon, Nye illuminates the true essence that can pull a person from a personal darkness. It is to sit in the darkness too and acknowledge the mysterious sorrow that beckons one into a place of despair. It is to keep showing up, to be present, to smile with authenticity, which has its own healing. When we reach out to one another from empathy, rather than from a need to be the savior, the tender gravity of kindness can be another's saving grace. Parker Palmer writes this about the poem and about the practice of kindness. In a world that can be as heedless and heartless as ours, kindness must grow from deep inner roots if it is to stand strong and be sustained. As the poet says, before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. As we move through this this time where in-person connection is not possible, the practice of kindness becomes even more essential. Many of us are experiencing sorrow and not being near the ones we love. We are missing human touch and the opportunities we once took for granted. We have the choice to grow bitter and resentful and to place blame for what is happening on those who do not deserve it. Or we can open our hearts to both give and receive kindness in newly innovative ways. I would love to hear how you know kindness as you socially distance and how you might share kindness too. My greatest hope for this era of COVID-19 is that we will emerge from it a softer, gentler people who finally realize that we need one another for our own survival. May that influence how we open our borders and our hearts to the migrant and how we really see the heart of one another. Practice kindness, my friends. Amen.
This morning, I would like to offer a prayer format that we use at the 9 o'clock service. It's a little bit modified since we don't have an audience, but it's also responsive prayer with prayer gestures. So I invite you to put your hands on your heart, and after I say, loving God, we will all respond, we open our hearts to you. I know that the traditional response is often, God, hear our prayers, or God, in your mercy, but we know that God hears our prayers, and it's up to us who need to be open to God's guidance. So join me in prayer. God of many names, we praise you for the beauty of this new day with all the opportunities to serve you. Loving God, we open our hearts to you. We send our love and care to all the caregivers, hospital staff, doctors, and nurses who are caring for the sick. Bless the work of their hands. Loving God, we open our hearts to you. We send our patience and creativity to the many parents and grandparents who are tending and teaching their little ones. We also send peace and comfort to the children and youth who miss their friends and are growing weary. Bless their hearts. Loving God, we open our hearts to you. For those who are dealing with loss of a loved one or a job or those ambiguous losses that we cannot name, Provide emotional comfort and financial security and community support. Loving God, we open our hearts to you. For those without a home, whether in our streets or at the border, let us be the shelter in the storm in all the varied ways that we can offer support. Loving God, we open our hearts to you. Remember also our government officials as they make decisions that affect the health and well-being of the nation. Grant them wisdom and patience and resolve to help even the least of these. Loving God, we open our hearts to you. In these moments of silence, I invite you to name your joys and concerns, all those things that are on your hearts. We thank you, God, for hearing those words spoken or unspoken. Holy One, may we choose love over fear, joy over despair, harmony over discord. May we have the strength to claim our authentic power, standing true in word and action and deed, and with firm resolve be the change we wish to see in the world. Together we pray as Jesus taught his friends to pray. Tender, loving God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you.
My friends, may God bless you and keep you, and may you give and receive kindness in new and profound ways, so that this day and always, you will know an abundance of peace. Amen and amen.